Williamsburg's leading cabinet maker, Christopher Kendall and his son Tom, find the master's employees, journeymen and apprentices, waiting outside the shop. The working day was long, but the pay was leisurely, and every journeyman enjoyed the prospect of becoming a master, and in due time, establishing his own business. His first day on the job, young Tom needs to learn his way around, and his father's workmen take a friendly interest in the boy. No favors, I want him to start at the bottom and be on his own every step of the way, Christopher tells one of his able journeymen as he starts the boy on his career as an apprentice. The master's principal duties were those of management, dealing with customers, casting accounts, often designing the furniture that was produced in his shop, and at all times carefully supervising the work of his journeyman. A journeyman, as the term indicates, was a worker who completed his term and training as an apprentice and was free to travel in search of employment. Many of our colonial craftsmen were influenced by the work of the best English cabinet makers. And here we see the master referring to Thomas Chippendale's Gentleman and Cabinet Makers Director as a guide for the design of a tea caddy. In England, during the Middle Ages, craftsmen for their mutual protection were associated in guilds, consisting of masters and apprentices. The masters being those skilled in a particular craft, and the apprentices those who were learning its mysteries. The power of the guilds had declined sharply by the 18th century, but the legal relation between master and apprentice continued. The apprentice was bound to service, usually for a period of seven years during which time he was fed, clothed, and housed at the master's expense in return for his work while learning the secrets and acquiring the skills of the craft. The usual practice, as we see here, was to assign the apprentice to a journeyman who taught him by instruction and example. Tom's training begins with an introduction to the more common tools of the craft, the bench clamp, the saw, the plane, tools which, along with most other manufactured articles, were often imported from England. It's not difficult to recognize them, for they're very much like those in use today. Nor is it difficult to realize that long months, even years, will be required for Tom to develop the true eye and the sure hand that distinguish the skilled craftsman. The importance of the workers in wood in the development of the modern world can scarcely be overestimated. The cartwheel, the water wheel, the spinning wheel, and above all that greatest of machine tools, the lathe, were first made of wood. In addition to its function in shaping furniture parts such as chair legs, balusters, and bedposts, this 18th century model apparently was equally serviceable in developing the muscles of the apprentice. Good tools well cared for, skilled hands, and a love for line and form combined to produce the best work of the colonial craftsman. Not work for its own sake, but work as the normal expression of a disciplined life as the hallmark of a well-organized society. In an age when many skills of this kind have been transferred to machines, we must recognize the necessity of providing suitable substitutes for the exercise of creative ability which the handicraft supplied. In the office of the royal governor, the governor's secretary sharpens his quill pen with a penknife and prepares to take dictation. The royal governor was the king's representative in the Virginia colony, 
and had great power in controlling the laws made by the colonists. His secretary uses shorthand in taking notes. Later, however, he will be obliged to copy them out in flowing longhand. At the dressing table, in her bedchamber, the governor's wife uses a Spanish comb carved from polished tortoise shell in arranging her hair. And from an English scent bottle, she uses perfume imported from France. Luxuries indeed in colonial trade. The governor's wife is a leader of women's fashion in the colony, and with the governor maintains a kind of miniature court modeled after that of the king and queen in England. Williamsburg was the scene of elaborate banquets and dancing assemblies, the most elegant of these being held in the palace. Manners were polished in the 18th century, and even the royal governor might not keep a lady waiting. The guns, swords, and pistols displayed in 18th century houses were placed not only as decorations, but also for real use in times of emergency. In this instance, the arms serve as a warning to any who might question the authority of the king's representative. Appearing below this gilded crown, a symbol of royal authority, is the cupola of the governor's residence, from which at night bright lights shone out on occasions of public rejoicing. Beneath the cupola, the balcony, hand-wrought product of the forge comes into view. Here the governor might address the king's loyal colonists. The wide hospitable doorway of the residence provides an appropriate frame for the governor and his lady as they emerge into the sunlight. The outer gate, however, was designed to be easily defended. Coaches were built high, and folding steps were necessary to enable the governor and his lady to enter in a comfortable and dignified fashion, because the roads, even the streets of Williamsburg, were unpaved and often muddy. The horses were usually spirited, which obliged the coachman to remain in his seat while his assistant, the footman, performed the service of opening and closing the door, lowering and raising the steps. Never one to fumble an opportunity to impress the people, the governor makes a ceremony always of being punctual. In the shop of Christopher Kendall, they know he will arrive promptly at the appointed hour to inspect the desk which they have designed and built at his direction. Though the governor's coach was a familiar sight in Williamsburg, it never seemed to lose its fascination for the children of the community. Forever curious to see at first hand whether the governor is so grand, so friendly, or so severe as the latest gossip has described him. As the governor and his lady advance to examine their desk, Christopher Kendall and his journeymen and apprentices prepare to experience one of the greatest satisfactions in the handicrafts, pride in workmanship. Each one has contributed to the perfection of this excellent example of cabinet work, and each one feels entitled to enjoy any praise the governor express as he examines with greatest interest the product of their combined skill. But now Christopher Kendall sends his workmen away. Perhaps he, the master craftsman, has done this part of the work himself. He reveals that a section of the desk, presumably a fixed part of it, has been skillfully constructed so that it can be removed, and that behind it, a false back conceals a set of small drawers where secret papers, jewels, or other valuables might be hidden. There were no banks with safe deposit vaults in Virginia in the 18th century, and such secret hiding places were often a feature of desks and other furniture. As his customer, with a wave of the hand, approves the work, Christopher Kendall contemplates the scene with satisfaction. He's not surprised that his work has found favor with the royal governor. He knows the product is everything it should be, and has a good conscience that it represents his best efforts. He is convinced that such work will always bring customers to his shop, and in good time to that of the son and grandsons he expects will follow him. Probably the first of all animals to be domesticated, the ox is still used for hauling heavy loads in the country districts of Virginia. In the 18th century, the ox's own competitor was the horse, whose greater speed was often an advantage, 
But the ox, on the other hand, because of his slow gait and greater strength, was considered safer for hauling. It was not an age of specialization, and this situation involving two oxen, five men and a boy, preparing to deliver a valuable product of handicraft to the governor's office, is entirely in keeping with the slow but certain methods of the time. century, the blacksmith shop was an important service station in every community. Here the smith wrought many sorts of objects in iron, and that important animal, the horse, was shod, either by the smith himself or by an expert horseshoer called a farrier. The horse's hoof grows like human nails and might split if not properly cared for. So the farrier, who was often a veterinary or animal doctor, trims and files the hoof after removing the old shoe. As in all handicraft, skill was passed along from generation to generation through the apprentice system. And in this case, an apprentice was needed to operate, among other things, the giant leather bellows that forced air through the fire to increase its heat. The huge chimney over the fire carries off the smoke, fumes, and some of the heat. The pub was hard and hot, and a supply of water close at hand was a necessity. The duty of keeping the water cool and fresh in the stout stoneware jug was another chore for the apprentice. Blacksmith was a mighty man indeed during the 18th century, for in addition to shoeing horses, he produced many of the implements and toolwork and hardware required by the locksmiths, coachmakers, and builders. The blacksmith's practiced eye tells him when the horseshoe was heated to the proper temperature and ready for forging between hammer and anvil. In the shoeing of a horse, the smith was known as the fireman or fitter out while the man working on the hoop itself should properly be the farrier. Holes were punched in the shoe to provide for the nails which are to fasten it to the hoop and it was only partially cooled before fitting, so that the hot iron would burn off any irregularities on the surface of the hoof. The shoe fits as the burned outline on the hoof reveals, so it goes back to the shop to be cooled. A time-honored jest between every blacksmith and his helper was the classic pleasantry, you shoe the flies and I'll shoe the horses. Many horses are nervous while being shod, therefore driving away the flies added to their comfort and in consequence added also to that of the farrier. A horse's hoof slopes gradually to the lower edge. The nails are driven into and through the hoof and are then bent over and broken off. The horse will suffer pain and injury unless the work is done skillfully. Benjamin Franklin knew this when he wrote, a little neglect may breed mischief. For want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. And for want of a horse, the rider was lost. The tavern was the informal center of community life. This one was named after Sir Walter Raleigh, who promoted the first expedition to colonize Virginia. Usually there was activity in the tavern dooryard, 
and there were always those who loafed or lingered there to see it. Even the pigs and geese which wandered loose in the streets tended to congregate there and add their voices to any confusion which might arise. At the moment, the scene is one of idleness and peace, which an energetic landlady regards it as her duty to disturb. During the 18th century, an event in village life anticipated with the greatest interest was the arrival at infrequent intervals of the post rider, the citizen's sole means of overland communication with the world beyond their horizon. His personal popularity and the innumerable opportunities which he had to recommend the tavern to travelers earns him a cooling drink landlords all along his route of travel. Bringing news from one town to another, often from one colony to another, was an important service. And in addition, the post rider's personal store of gossip gathered along his route was often more up to date than the mail which he carried. The postal service was not without influence in creating a desire for education, since it inspired in those who wished to use it a desire to read and write. In the office of his cabinet shop nearby, the working day is over for Christopher Kendall. He takes up his stick and hat and starts for home. On his way with his son, they passed the public jail, which was called a strong, sweet prison. Though many died in it from smallpox and typhoid fever, petty offenders were exposed to public scorn in the stocks or pillory. The seat or rail of the stocks was sharp on top and became extremely tiresome and uncomfortable after an out to. The prisoners in the pillory became a target for anyone wishing to add to their punishment. The law which imprisoned debtors created a greater problem than it solved, the prisoner obviously having no means of earning money while confined. Debtors generally were allowed the more comfortable cells. A chance for release, however, depended either upon a pardon from assistance from relatives or friends. Their appeals, therefore, were frequent and often pitiful. Allowed a fixed sum for each prisoner's food, Jailers sometimes swindled the state and starved the prisoners. Food was passed to the prisoner through a slot in the wall or a door in order that he might not overpower the jailer and take his keys, though this sometimes happened. The criminal cells were furnished only with a bed of straw for the prisoner, who here lacking a chair sits at the base of the crude sanitary facilities to eat his meal of miserable prison fare. Constantly exposed to the distress and complaints of offenders, jailers generally became hardened to the woes of their prisoners, and the poor debtor secured attention only with the greatest difficulty. Activity in the Kendall home continued by candlelight. Music lessons, usually on the popular harpsichord, were included in the education of most young ladies. The boys, however, learn to live the hard way, and Tom, after a full day in the shop, is obliged to struggle with his lessons before retiring to bed. The master, who has been exchanging the time of day with friends at the tavern, returns home with a copy of the Virginia Gazette. In contrast with the morning and evening editions of our daily newspapers, this gazette appeared once a week and gave its subscribers ample time to read and consider every word in its four small pages. Comfortable on the floor, little Philip learns the names and order of his country's kings and queens by fitting together a jigsaw puzzle. Meanwhile, his mother, doubtless herself raised in the belief that the devil finds work for idle hands to do, sits in her accustomed place at the spinning wheel, busily spinning out the thread that will be woven into cloth for clothing her family. Christopher Kendall reminds his family that in a household where breakfast is served at 6.30 a.m., it's wise for young people to retire at least eight or 10 hours ahead of that time. The working day then lasted usually until the sun went down. 
And without the diversions of moving pictures, telephones, radio, and an organized amusement business outside the home, the prospect of going to bed early did not seem too dismal. Tom and Lucy retire with Philip. Without protesting at being older, they're entitled to stay up later. As they ascend the friendly old stairs to bed, their father resumes his chair to enjoy a pipe of tobacco. Tobacco in Virginia was used as money as well as for smoking, and for many years, rated as legal medium of exchange. Grandmother turns her hand to the loom, a type used for weaving small materials, possibly in this instance tape for Venetian blinds which were popular in the South, as the slats made in the cabinet shop admitted any cooling breeze while excluding the hot sun. It's quiet now, and after finishing his pipe, Christopher Kendall decides to call it a day. Before locking up for the night, he steps to the door for a breath of air and a glance at the stars and considers he takes the kitten with him. At the door, he sees the lamplighter and watchman who is making his rounds. This worthy, who knows everybody in town, is certain to have the latest news, and Christopher advances to exchange a word with him at the gate. Tonight, we may assume there's nothing more important than local gossip, a neighborly word and friendly nod that warms the heart. And so, as the 18th century cabinet maker turns to where his curtain bed is waiting, it is with the satisfaction that something attempted, something done, has earned a night's repose.